Susan Trish, who you heard. She's our executive director now. And um, we're very excited to be working again with MAGIC, a, a great partnership. So um, I'm going to hand this over to Carolyn Sprouse, and she's going to introduce you to our team here from MAGIC. And we've got a real powerhouse team here who can help you with all the questions that you need. Um, and we're going to go through the PowerPoint. And if you've got questions, please type them in. We can see your questions, and we'll be happy to answer them. Um, we've got magic coming up, and there's all these different areas that uh, you need to know about where you fit in. And also, we're launching our new emerging designers. And so, any of you from emerging designers who've been selected, please let us know too. So, thanks so much, everybody, magic team. It's another pleasure to be here. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Carolyn Sprouse, our leader and uh, she's going to explain to you her job description and her team here, and we're here to help you. Good afternoon, everyone, mm -hmm. and thank you for joining us today. This is Carolyn Sprouse, Vice President for Magic International. As we're going through the webinar, if you there's a lot of people um, helping us out today on the panel, so if you can't hear someone speaking, just type that into the comments, and we'll adjust the sound accordingly. Um, first of all, I would like to have Susan Kennett introduce herself. She's with our WWD Magic team. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Susan Kennett. I'm the Retail Relations Manager. Our team is the team that brings the retailers to the show to buy from you. And next we have Laura Matthews. Hi, everybody. I'm the Sales Director for Pool Trade Show and Project Women the women's category of that show, um, and I'm here to help with some tips on pool trade show in particular. And next we have Sharon Barboza. Hello. Uh, thank you for coming and being with us today, and I represent the footwear part of Magic FN Platform Footwear Show. I also work with the retailers and bring them to the show for you, so I would be happy to answer any questions about exhibiting or about retail. Thank you very much. And our veteran in the room, <laughs> Linda Harrison, who has worked in pretty much all aspects of the magic marketplace but specializes in contemporary and progressive women's at Project Now. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Linda Harrison. I am sales manager for Project Women's, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have for me with regard to wholesaling, getting ready for the show, what have you. So as you can see, we have a panel of experts from all aspects of the marketplace. So whether you're um, working with accessories, you're a brand new uh, emerging designer, you're just starting out in pool, um, footwear, et cetera, you have uh, the experts here in the room. So before we get started, and I'll turn this back over to Francis, um, the first thing we want to talk about is what are your objectives for being in Las Vegas for any of the various trade shows for the Magic Marketplace? So I'd like you to think about the questions that I'm going to um, ask you and really make sure that you're taking notes and writing down what it is, what's your main primary objective for for exhibiting? You're spending a lot of money and your time is very valuable and you want to make sure that you're prepared and that's really what we're here to talk to you about today. So number one, are you there just for marketing and press? Are you launching something new that you really want to get out to the press? Um, next, do you want to meet buyers? If you do want to meet buyers, who are the type of buyers do you want to meet at the show? Do you want to meet big box retailers? Are you focusing on specialty buyers? What category of business? What, it, what type of product are those buyers currently buying that you want to reach out to? Um, next, some people want to know if you can sell items for cash at the show. There's very, can you do this at Magic? Can you sell cash items at Pool, at FN Platform? Are you there to network and gather names to increase your contacts? This is always another primary reason for going to a trade show. 
And if you are, how do you plan on doing that? Do you have your schedule intact? Have you looked at all the various events and networking opportunities that the shows offer? Next question, are you testing new products? Are you there to really get client feedback about those products? What are your minimum and maximum orders that you're prepared to accept? You know this now ahead of time. Do you know, again, a minimum for a U.S. buyer versus an international buyer that may walk into your booth? What are your terms for custom orders? Do you know what your delivery times are? Remember, you only get one chance with a buyer. If you don't deliver on time, you're never going to get a second chance. And then lastly, this is really, really important. Do you want to target small boutique owners or buyers from larger shows? You have to be able to answer these questions before you sign that contract for any of our shows. Okay, so next, we're going to, I'm going to turn this back over to Frances, our expert, and she's going to talk about preparing. Okay, so uh, all those questions that you've just had a list of are things you need to think about and have an answer for before you go there. And now we're going to talk a little bit about preparing yourself as far as your branded image is concerned, because having a branded story is going to be critical to the success of your company and creating that look and knowing your niche, who are you selling to, who's going to buy it, what's your story, and why would they buy it. So you've got to know all this before you go because these are going to be part of your elevator pitch. And why would they buy it and for what price point? Who are they? Demographics. You know, these days you don't say, oh, my demographics is 19 to 29, okay? More these days, it's going to be lifestyles, their income bracket, where they live demographic-wise. So you need to sort of have a clear understanding of who it is that's going to be buying your product. So, and your brand should tell a story, and the, the story must be authentic. Do you have a story or a hook? We're going to talk a little bit of it later on about marketing. Um, but the first thing you need to think about is to be seen at least six times before people are going to really understand who you are. And it's like I always say, you think about seeing a new trend and you see somebody in leggings the first time and you think they've forgotten to put a skirt on and eventually you see it three or four times and eventually you go out and buy the get leggings yourself and you're not wearing a skirt. But it's about that acceptance of your brand and they need to understand what it is that your, your new company is all about. So it needs to have these key factors. It needs to make sure that your quality is consistent, your price points within that range of price points where you've pre-identified, the feel and the look is authentic, the image also is authentic, and it's true to your market niche. Always consider those, and that's going to rule you when you begin your branding story. So, quality of design. Remember that the more work you put into it, of course, then it's going to cost more money. So then you'll be in a better price point. So what is it that goes into your garment? You know, remember that your garment, when I used to teach, the garment should look as good on the inside as it does on the outside. Not always possible. But look at the factors of sewing details. Make sure that your samples look impeccable. If you're opening it up, I, mean, I always think of someone like the Johnny Watt. When he first came out with his line, it was fantastic. Well, it still is fabulous. He's got a real branded look without having his name all over it. But you look at it and you know, Johnny Watt. Mm -hmm. And what he did when he started out, the detail on the inside of his garments was fabulous. And you'd open up a garment, it's got silk lining and it was in different colors. And you immediately had a brand identification just by the way he'd finished his garments. So what is it that you're doing that if you're in that better wear category, what can you do if you're doing a black jacket? Do you have to have black lining? Or can you include some maybe pattern lining or silk lining that makes it different? Remember that detail is why people are buying clothes these days. It's not about we need a new jacket. It's not about we need a new skirt or a new pant. It's an impulse buying. You feel good in it. You need it. You want it to dress up something you've already got. 
So you've got to be able to hook into that frenzy of why people are going to buy your garments. And that's all part of your branded uh, message. Make sure that it fits well. You think of uh, some of the denim, premium denim. You go out and you buy a premium denim pair of jeans. You like the fit. You go back because you know the fit's going to be good. This is all part of your branding. It's also part of when you sell on the web, they want to know, okay, I know the fit of those jeans. I know they're going to fit me well. I can go and buy them. So you need to know, well, who are my garments going to fit? Unfortunately, in America, you don't have sizing. So the sizing's a little skewered compared to European sizes, which are more standardized. So you need to identify before you go to market, who are these garments going to fit? How, what is your grade method going to be? When you start off with your first sample, what is it, a two or a four or a six? Where are you going to begin and what sizing? So that's important for you to have that branded image so that when we come back next year and we say, wow, I remember that label and it had some pants that really fit well. You need to remember that part of your branded image is the fit of the garment. I'd like to add to that too. When um, It's Lara from Pool and Project here. When we're looking at who we um, approve for Pool and Project, we look at this criteria for curating our shows and making sure that the people that show at Pool or Project will match what's going on in the market. So we do look at the quality of the design, the fabrics, the trims, and all of that goes into, into our trade. Should you talk about fits of uh, sizing? Um, not specifically. It's more whether it's on trend and the quality's there and how it's being made and all of that. It helps us to decide which trade show they would be best at. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, good. Well, uh, the sizing issue, I'm sure... It is a huge issue in the U.S. I'm just one, I was just curious from the, all of the people that you've worked with now, if there is a set sample size. Is it a two, is it a four, is it a six? I mean, I know it's kind of all over the place, but if you were to generalize, where would be the best? I think we have to analyze, first of all, what's gone on recently with fitting, with sizing. Of course, mm -hmm. people have got bigger. So if you look at a size six they don't now. Want to size. No, that's <laughs> right. So if you look at a size six now, you look at a size six 24, 20 years ago. So when, I mean, I'm still a six and a four, and I'm, I know I'm much bigger than I was when I was a six 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, and I've got a form that's probably 20, the dress form that's 20 years old that is now what you consider a two, but it's got an eight on it. So sizes have got wow. been bigger. So if you look at vintage clothing mm -hmm. and you will look at, say, a 12, that's probably like a six now. Mm -hmm. So, but you for, for going to think about, okay, where do I begin? Normally, when you're in a sample room, you'll start with a mid size. So we'll normally go to say these that used to be six, but probably four. So if you're doing a sample four, what I always tell new designers is go go to the companies who've already done this. Mm -hmm. Go to Banana Republic website. Look at their sample sales. Look at their samples of their grading rules. So you can then look and say, okay, my grading rules are going to be, okay, this is a size four, it's going to be fit a 34 bust, it's going to be a 25 waist, it's going to be a 36 hip. So what is it, and then how much bigger does it get? So if I'm doing a size four to six, is my grade rule one and a half inches, or two inches, or one inch? So you need to understand that, because the retailer is going to ask you that. I'm Sue for Retail Relations again. Um, one of the things that the retailers look at, if you're going to do business with the online retailers, some of them have their own um, sizing right. that you have to follow. Mm -hmm. So for your specialty stores and some mm -hmm. of the big box stores, you'll have one set of sizing. And then for your online and some of the big box stores, you'll have another set of sizing. And you have to be open enough to do different grading as well. It has to be depending on who you're targeting. The order has to be worth it, though. Absolutely. I mean, uh, if you're going through the price and expense of doing different grade rules for different companies. But if you're going after someone like uh, QVC or HSN Home Shopping Network, something like that, if those are the people that you're targeting, they'll give you the rules. Right. What about in footwear? Is it important to always list both the European and U.S. sizing? I think that with the uh, growth of Internet retail now, even more important, not more important, excuse me, in addition to the regular brick-and-mortar store, you have to be able to have both European sizing for your shoes and American sizing. 
But the most important thing for new people in the business is to know who your competitor is. So when you even go, let's say you design a beautiful shoe line and you love it, who are you selling against? Who is your competitor? Who do you got? You would like sit with at retail. You have to know that, and then you can go to the store and look at their shoes and actually look at their sizing and sometimes even try them on, bring someone with you so you know different shoes run different ways. Different European shoes run different than American shoes. So absolutely have to have both ways. They're a little bit more, shoes are more standard than clothing in some ways. So if you were, it's 38 European, it's like right. a seven. Yes. Seven yes, that's true. But whereas, you know, you compare a size 38 in Europe to not, not shoe size, I mean clothing, it can be very confusing to an American size. And then you've got, if you're doing a Missy, sort of zero, two, four, six, eight, and then you've got juniors, right. which are oh, the odd okay. sizes, and they tend to be much smaller. And um, so, you you know, you need to know, know, hopefully no one's going in the junior sizes here because the, the, the price point, so you couldn't do it because they're so much lower. We have a couple of questions here. Okay. Um, the first from Sandra, she says, I'm an emerging designer. Do you recommend bringing a brand book? You mean your own lookbook? That's what I'm assuming that means, a lookbook, yes, most definitely. Um, I, I think it's all part of your, your marketing mm -hmm. material that you have that brand book, uh, your lookbook, also part of your website. I tell brands that, this is Linda Harrison speaking, I tell brands to definitely bring a press book to place on the table to leave through as you're talking. It's nothing, there's nothing wrong with showing your potential client the looks that you've, you've gotten press on. This is the, the world in which we live and this is how you Grow brand. A lot of brands are also doing them on their iPad now, just having mm -hmm. it there for yeah, the right. design, the retailers to flip through. This is Susan from Retail Relations. We also have um, a press office at the show where they can drop off press packets if they're showing in the show. And then the Retail Relations team works a lot with the manufacturers and the retailers showing on our iPad new and emerging designers who are showing at the show. Do they know how to find you? We're on the website mm -hmm. as the retail relations team. It's Susan Chenitz and Sandy Shapiro are the two people that you would contact, and then we will put you through to whoever you need to speak with. We have another question from Allison, and she says, you mentioned having Euro sizing for shoes, but what about for socks? Uh, this is Sharon from Footwear. Yes, absolutely, you need to have that also European sizing for socks. As a matter of fact, socks is one of the fastest growing Categories in footwear. I mean, children's socks, women's socks, all kinds of hosiery, but especially socks that are unique and different. So if you're making little baby socks that don't match, we want them. We want you to bring socks to the footwear show. Absolutely. Okay. This is another so question. Let's see. This is well. Sandra says I have lookbooks that have recently learned it is recommended to have a brand book. Brand books also. If they're talking about, we always say that if you have a collection, it needs to be cohesive and you need to have a brand story. So I'm assuming that's what we're talking about is what's the story? What sets your brand apart from all of the, just think about it, Magic. There's 4,000 exhibitors, over 5,000 brands, and nearly 20,000 product lines. So how are you going to set your business apart from all of those other people. The retailers are coming to the show primarily to find new resources. They have their set brands that they're doing business with season after season. So they're saving some of their open to buy and about 25% of their business for those new niche brands that they haven't yet discovered yet. So I think when you're talking about a brand book, that yes, the story you really need to, um, and Laura, Laura will get into this later about how you merchandise and and your story should flow from not, not only you personally, but your whole team to the way you merchandise your booth, to your website, to your marketing materials. They all have to have a cohesive look and feel. Okay, the next is from Shoni. We have two questions. Um, do you recommend selling fall immediate for footwear? What do buyers usually purchase as far as packages, and do we recommend using models or just place the footwear on the shelf? Hi, Shoni. This is Sharon, again from Footwear. Uh, we definitely recommend that you have immediates for fall because many of the buyers today in the stores 
would like to buy closer to the season, it's great to have both. So if you have immediate merchandise for the holidays, that's not a problem. You can bring it. Uh, I, I assume you're uh, exhibiting with us at the platform. The other question about the models, we do allow you to have the models inside your booth putting the shoes on, but you are not allowed to have the models walking on the show floor in any of the shows, even if it's WWD, women's, or pool, or project. We don't allow that, but absolutely you could bring a model to have your footwear showing inside the booth for the buyers. That's a very good idea. But make sure that that model knows what she's wearing. <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, there's people are going to be asking us, so she needs the 30-second elevator pitch. Right. Anybody, right. anybody needs that. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, and we really we have one more question, but we really need to kind of get moving here. Um, really quickly, Jasmine says, as emerging designers, should I spend a lot of money on branding my actual booth? Well, I can speak to that. Okay. For a pool trade show, we recommend that you make the focus of your booth your product. Mm -hmm. Obviously, bring some kind of signage, and we have guidelines on how to put together a professional-looking booth in terms of signage. We don't want wrinkled up vinyl banners and so on. So just make it about your products. Make sure your logo is clear. Even a black and white logo on the back of your booth is fine. Um, and that's really all you need to do. Well, I always think, just to sort of, I know we're going to get to this, but your booth is a reflection of what it's going to look like in a retail store. Mm -hmm. So think of it as a store window. You need to be merchandising that booth as it should be looking, hopefully, eventually, in someone's store. Not just a big swap meet look. Okay, so I see we have a couple more slides, but due to time constraints, we need to move forward, but we will get to you, okay? So just hang in there. Okay. okay. All right, so talking about preparing for market, your financial and business plan. I would say, like to ask all of you, how many of you got a business plan, how many of you have updated it, and how many of you got a financial plan? So it needs, you need to know this before you go to the show. You have this one chance. You go there, and you get these orders, and suddenly you call me up a week later and say, you've got all these fabulous orders, Francis, how do I find the money? You need to know where the money's coming from before you go, how much money you've got, and can you afford to do the production? So, you know, if you're taking orders for only five, are you going to manufacture them? If your financial plan is for 500 or 1,000 or 2,000, then you need to make sure that you've got that in your mind. So having a financial and a business plan is going to be key to your success. Sometimes you do really, really well, and maybe you haven't got the funding to produce it, and you've got to say, I cannot take any more orders. But you need to have that plan. So know where your money's coming from. and Go and see your bank manager. How do you get that money? You're not going to get factored on your first show. So identify where that money, that money is coming from. Having a costing sheet also, don't leave the costing to the last minute. Uh, we we do extensive cost analysis for um, webinars and seminars, and I think we've probably got some that you could log into, but understanding what goes into a cost sheet is another like a whole day workshop. But you seriously need to do those cost sheets before you go to market and make sure that you understand what the costs are on your net and your profit margins and making sure that you are remember that when you go to market with your costs. Developing costs, okay. Um, these are your hidden costs. They necessarily won't go in the cost sheet but you need to know that. How much does it cost you to run your business? What's your rent? And then you divide it by how many units you expect to be making. So then you can think about, okay, well, I'm going to be making estimated 5,000 units, and each unit should have approximately 10 cents added to it. It doesn't have to necessarily go into it, but it's your overhead charge cost. So you need to understand what it is that goes into a cost sheet, what it is that goes into producing those garments, uh, a lot of design-driven companies are, are driven by making too many samples. Remember, each sample will cost you about $500 to do the pattern and the production. So don't go making too many samples. A lot of times you can do a lot of that virtually with Illustrator and Photoshop. You need to track your expenses by the season because um, this is why we're here, guys. We're here because we see so many wonderful creative companies and they've got great ideas, and two years later, they're not around. Why is it? It's because it's not because of the creativity. It's because they don't understand the business. So you need to get, get a full understanding of what goes into the cost sheet 
so that you can be here next year and the year after and continue to be so. And if you're just a designer, hire, hire a business manager. Yeah. Really important. Right. Get a consultant who can help you. Like Francis. Folks, we will get to your questions at the end of this webinar just so we can make sure we get through everything, okay? So hang in there. So when you do your first time costing, um, remember we talked about sampling. It costs you $500 and you've got to do it three times, four times. You have a problem. You need to make sure that when you're working with a sample maker or a contractor, you give them the instructions, you give them the sizing, you give them garments of similarities of how you want it to be made if you haven't got training. Um, you need to remember that your labor costs, usually a sample is going to be about three times the price of what it would be in production. So, um, and then you've usually got, okay, fabric and labor, usually around about the same price. So you need to be considering this all the time when it comes into designing a garment. It's not just about designing a garment. It's about, okay, I know my niche. I can design the garment. I can choose the fabric. I can get the styling. And I know the top stitching. So all those things go into creating a garment that people will love and want to rebuy. Signing the sales reps, um, paying commission. This also, if you've got a sales rep and they get you, as in shoes and accessories, 15%, and then if you're going to Magic and it's another $10,000, all that twice a year and all the trade shows you go to, these go into your hidden cost. So you need to remember if you've got a sales rep, not only are you paying them 15% or 10% or 12, you may be paying them showroom participation fee, which in New York could be anything from 800 to 1200, or in LA it's usually a little bit lower, but you need to factor those costs into your price sheet, into your cost sheet. Make sure also, before you go to Magic, you've got your legal work in place. This is something I just, just quickly Right, reiterate, if you're a, a California manufacturer, that means you are the one buying the fabric, giving it to a contractor to sew, you are defined as the manufacturer, you need a manufacturer's license. So make sure that you find out how to get that, you need your RN number, mm -hmm. registration number, that's, you, that's free. But the a manufacturing no, a license, you have to take a test and it costs about 750 a year, depending on the size of the company. So don't go out and start selling like uh, CNC of California did without a license and suddenly they got on Oprah and they got all these orders and they hadn't got their manufacturing license. So they ended up having to pay huge penalties. And we've got companies who had all the goods confiscated because they haven't got that manufacturing license. It's very stringent. Very important for you to have that. Okay, what else? Um, we've got line sheets, order forms pre-show. So how do you get your line sheets and what is a line sheet? In fact, we had an email this week from somebody, one of our emerging designers, how many line sheets to take. And I recommended around about 50. You're not going to be giving these out to everybody. You should have marketing postcards for people to take, business cards, your order forms, of course. Um, and remember, all these should be have the look and feel have your logo on it, should, people should then begin to bring, uh, build that brand identity. Do you want to add anything, Laura, to this, this? We talked about the line sheets, and we are doing a class on this next week. I would just um, also mention having the postcards at the show is great, but also making sure that you're sending those out ahead of time to keep buyers that you want to target. Um, and make sure it's not an afterthought, like Francis said. When you're when you're looking at your website, your marketing material, your postcards, everything should have the consistent brand messaging on it. Um, I can add and speak to Paul that um, in preparing the marketing materials, once they are prepared, um, we have lots of platforms, as do the other trade shows as well, in helping you to pre-market yourself at Pool. We help you in postcards and banners for your social media pages and helping you prepare email blasts and lots and lots of things that are outlined in a document that we have called This Way to the Pool, which we'll go into a little bit later, but it's a big part of preparing for pool is marketing. And we, so part of what the retail relations team does is work hand in hand with manufacturers coming into the show, getting you prepared, looking at the different um, things you can do to market yourself throughout the 
WWD floor as well, as well as the Magic floor. We do a lot of interface with manufacturers. Uh, go on the websites, look for customers of the same genre, look for your customers from other people's lists and get your postcards out and make sure that your booth number is on that postcard. And on your line sheets and your order form, make sure you get the store's business card and the name and phone number of the store. We get many, many phone calls. I took an order. I don't have the name. I don't have the phone number. Mm -hmm. So get those line sheets prepared and your marketing material. It's just as important before the show as it is after the show and while you're there. And one of the biggest issues we have is who are you and what do you do and what makes you different? Remember, you've got three seconds to connect with someone who's walking by. So how are you going to connect with that person? Do they know your line? How, what is it that you are selling? Remember to rehearse and have everybody around you. If you're going to have your aunt or your mother there, make sure they know what they're selling and that they can identify what it is that your 30-second elevated pitch is all about, like having the model that she's scripted. And don't you have a, a line sheet class? Yes. Is coming up? We do. On the 28th, we're having a class at the FBI office um, in the CalMart, L.A., uh, line sheets and Photoshop, so you can go to our website and sign up for that. We're also doing an, another um, Photoshop class this Saturday as well. So. Okay, good. Um, Pre-show marketing, we talked about making sure. Have you got any, any of you ladies around here have got hints on you sending out cards? To I have something to say, yeah. if you don't mind. My, I'm Sharon from the Footwear Show from Magic Marketplace. One of the most important things to this postcard that people forget for some reason to put their website, put their email address on there. The world today is all about the computer. People don't even sometimes look at the postcard, but if they have your email address or your website, they're going to look you up. You have to have information on the postcard. Sometimes if you're an exhibitor, you don't get your booth number in time to get the postcard sent out pre-show. You can even get a sticker and put it on top of that and send it out. You have to go, like Sue said, go on the uh, other people's websites, get the uh, the other people's addresses off it, the other buyers, the other stores, call the store. It's okay to actually call a store and ask for the buyer of the footwear department or the clothing department. Many times, if you're nice on the phone, they will give you the buyer's name and the email address. They won't do it all the time, but a lot of times they'll do that. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of our new exhibitors always want to know, how can I reach my buyers? We don't sell that type of list to this company yet. Okay. We'll be doing that in the, in, in the future. And truthfully speaking for the buyers, let's do again just very quickly. Mm -hmm. Speaking for the buyers, please, please, please decide who you are before you go. Mm -hmm. um, start with the mom and pop stores and then work up to the bigger stores. Because if you go for the big stores, they'll put, they can put you out of business immediately. Start with those small stores first. I would also recommend at the... Um, California Mart or online, you can get the salesman guide by category of business, and that list, it's not, it's like any buyer's list that you buy, it's not completely accurate, but it's updated every year, and you can do it by kids, men, women, and it gives you the mailing address, email addresses, you know, for a price, depending on what edition mm -hmm. you buy, so that's that's a really useful tool for a first time to, uh, brand getting started. And then putting a press release together, are you sending a press release out before you go? What is in the press release? You know, it's not just about, you know, Liz Taylor's new line. By the way, try not to use your own name. It's not a really good idea. You might become so popular that, like, Jill Sanders sold it to Prada and then fell out with Prada. She lost the name. Or the other uh, unfortunate part is that you go bankrupt and you lose your name. So it's not always. And also choose something that people can remember. I had somebody in last week that had a name that was like, I couldn't even pronounce it the second time. Mm -hmm. So remember, you've got to have a label that people can suddenly say, oh, I'm wearing XOXO or BCBG or, you know, you've got something on that people can really remember. Having that press release, why is it you're doing this? Think of some of these great brands now that are doing well, Tom's Shoes. 
I mean, you know, he's giving a pair of shoes away. He's got a great story, a great company. You know, so what is it that you're doing? Are you giving something away? Are you doing something for the rest of the world? Or is it, you know, just about you and your line? So otherwise, the editors see all these press releases 50 times. Like, you've got to have, have a hook. Is there anything you are, I mean, when you see, you, you must see plenty of press releases. <laughs> well, again, it has to be something interesting and, and not just, you know, really with press releases, it's the squeaky wheel gets the oil. It's like the person, you have to be persistent and continue to get your messaging out as across as many channels as possible. So just sending one press release off to California Apparel News is not going to get you anywhere. But sending it, calling them calling WWD, contacting our, you know, at the show, we have a press office, as was mentioned, your press kit there, and make sure you have it at your booth. Make sure when you're you're contracting for Magic or Pool or any of the other shows that you're sending in visuals. Just the, the simplest thing. You, wouldn't, you, you would probably find this hard to believe, but getting our contracted exhibitors to send us visuals of their new product lines is one of the most challenging things that our sales representatives face. And then our retail team thinks the salespeople are lazy. And it's really not true, actually, because um, the retail team is anxious and waiting. to. They're talking to buyers every day, and they know that's the number one reason they're coming to the show. So they're excited to say, hey, listen, you know, I've got this new line coming out, even if it's a brand that's been around for 100 years, like Perry Ellis, but they're launching a new new um, category of business. We want to know about it so we can help you talk about it. So don't think that you're being um, pushy. Persistence is going to win out over anything. Um, just to quickly address a couple of questions up there one before we go on. One of them about the manufacturing license. Uh, Bethany, if you're producing in California, make sure that you, um, if you're using a SOA, that they have their contractor's license. And um, if you're outside the states and doing business outside the states, that's fine. But if you're actually manufacturing anything in California, you need to understand that manufacturing license. And I think we have on our website information on that. So, um, and then when it comes to receiving orders, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Okay, so. Carolyn, we're talking about now why magic and so why what it's an amazing opportunity. So uh, part of why we're even doing a webinar such as this is because we know that um, doing a trade show, in particular doing such a big event like the Magic Marketplace, is not a cheap venture. But it's it's very important. Any brand, if you've gone to FITM or pretty much any trade school in the business, you've heard about magic, learned about brands such as Levi's and so forth that have been exhibiting since our inception. We've been in business over 80 years. We, we know how to help you, but we can't help you without you participating along the way. So a lot of people ask, why, why do magic versus hiring a sales rep going door to door or doing smaller niche regional shows? And really at the end of the day, the reason we have a footwear show and we have an advanced contemporary show and we have a women's show and, and along with the rest of the Magic Marketplace is that we have provided a niche opportunity from global retailers to come to one place twice a year to see what the U.S. has to offer. And in doing so, we're actually saving you money. On average, it's costing you three and a half times more money if you were to try to do this business on a door-to-door -door basis, traveling, hiring a sales team. You have the opportunity to reach a really large group of people that are targeted buyers all in one place at one time. So that's really what this is telling you. It gives you an idea as you're going through your um, marketing plan where you should spend your money. Typically, doing a trade show such as Magic is going to give you the most ROI, but then you have to go through the steps. And next, we'll go through the, what we feel are the 10 key steps to exhibiting at Magic. So, how can you get the best return on your investment? We've already talked a lot about the pre-show steps, so I won't 
spend a lot of time on this. We've talked about defining your objective, number one, before you even get to the show or even think about signing a contract. Next, determine what your buyers, that, who are your buyers at the show. I can't tell you how much time is wasted. Remember what I said. We have 4,000 exhibitors at MAGIC. And you are going to see people from all facets of the, of the industry. So you have about 30 seconds when that person walks in your booth to determine if they're a decision maker and if they're even really interested in the category that you're selling. So be your brand. Um, next, identify your best prospects. I think Sue, Laura, Francis all hit on this, knowing ahead of time Go, we call it retailing. Go to retail stores. Look where the people that you want to be, who you aspire to. Where do those people sit at retail so that you know the types of buyers that you want to attract to your booth? Um, and then number four, staff your booth with what we call start brand ambassadors. So I think um, after, we, after you really look at four and five, how do you prepare differently at a trade show? I'd like to um, pass it over to Laura from Pool to talk about really what being your brand is by showing that not only in who you are, but what you're doing at your booth. Thank you. So, yeah, we see some beautiful, amazing booths at Pool, and then we also see some opportunities for improvement. And some of the areas that I'm always jumping in on show sites and, hey, guys, let me help you kind of reconfigure your booth a little bit, and we're always kind of giving unsolicited advice. So I thought we'd pre-handle some of it. So a few quick tips. Uh, we know you've traveled a long way and you've brought a lot of stuff with you, but please avoid putting cardboard boxes or storage containers in your booth. Just as Francis said earlier, merchandise your booth as if it was a retail store. You don't see cardboard boxes in retail stores. Um, if you can avoid eating in your booth, just it's not the canteen, there are cafe areas where you can go and sit. I know some of you travel and you're on your own, so it's unavoidable, but um, just one little tip, it's not the most appealing approach for a buyer. Um, also, wear your designs. If you've designed a piece of jewelry or a t-shirt, then you are your best spokesperson and your best model, and it's it's free advertising. Use your body to get the message out there. So often we see people, I'm like, why aren't you wearing your stuff? Um, avoid blocking the entrance to your booth. Um, sometimes when things, you know, you're in between appointments. I, we've seen people standing at the front of their booth with their arms crossed, kind of just watching what's going on. But it's not very welcoming. Um, also, since you guys have so many beautiful designs, it's quick and easy way to showcase it is on a mannequin. Um, I would say use as many mannequins as, as possible, especially at pool, because sometimes on the racks it can get a little crowded, so it's nice to kind of showcase it. We talked earlier about not overly decorating your booth, definitely building your brand story, but not um, doing too much with the decor. Just keep it super simple and keep your signage professional. Um, Another big part of preparing for a trade show, specifically at pool, we've prepared, as I mentioned earlier, a document called This Way to the Pool. <clears throat> and it's really a checklist for getting ready for pool trade show in particular. It goes through everything from um, registering your staff for their badges, booking your hotel rooms, but also highlighting all the marketing opportunities that we have put in place for pool brands, everything from the show directory to email newsletters to how to capitalize on all the social media that we do. Um, so definitely, as soon as you contract with us, you get sent this document, and you can literally go through it like a checklist and strike each item off. So we really help our brands get ready. Um, some other things, I don't know if I'm like, this is dipping past pre, pre-show. pre Right into at the show. Okay, so... Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> at the show, um, I see lots of different processes going on in terms of tracking who you spoke to. One uh, item that we provide in helping you track who you spoke to is we give you a journal, a pool trade show journal, and I see people stapling in the business card and writing notes underneath. It's super old school, but it works, and it's a backup plan, and we give you one for every trade show, and I see brands telling me, I have one for every show, and I put the date on the front, and I refer back to it, and 
and just a super little helpful tool. Um, and that's that's really it for my at the show and pre-show tips from Paul. Any other? Sharon. I have something to say to all of our new fabulous exhibitors. Um, everyone loves their cell phone. Everyone loves their computer. But the buyers do not like to see you on your cell phone or on your computer, even though I know you're adding up that big order that you received from someone. <laughs> but if you could possibly keep it to the minimum as much as you can. No, that's a really you realize. Good. But and a lot of times, buyer will walk right by your booth. And you maybe have five seconds, and if you're on the phone or you're just your head in the computer, they just keep walking mm -hmm. because we all want to be recognized. You walk into, I don't care if it's a restaurant or a booth, you want someone to say hello. You don't have to be real conversational in the beginning. You can let them look at your product and it's all about your product. It's all about putting the right colors up in front of the booth. If it's a, a clothing, you want to put something pretty in the front. Don't put black. We right. don't have black. Right. Don't put a brown shoe. Forget it. yellow. Yellow is the hottest color for shoes right now. So put something out that brings them in. Once you get them in, you're on. Well, it brings up also a good, uh, there's a question here. Is it possible to run a booth by yourself without additional sales team from Shoney? And I have a, it is possible, but it could be detrimental. And there's, there's a couple things you have to keep in mind. If you're going to hire a temporary employee to work your booth, you better make sure that you're spending a couple of weeks with them prior to the show, training them, uh, practicing your elevator speech, making sure they know your brand story, where you started, why, why, where the con where it was conceived, and make sure that they feel your conviction and that's coming through on the message. Um, even if you do that, let me give you an example. A friend of mine worked the booth, hired a couple of extra people, all. Um, last show and on the third day she had to use the restroom we all do and Nordstrom walked in her booth and she was in the bathroom. But that can that cannot be avoided but my point is is whoever's helping you should be able to have that conversation in your absence. And a lot of times I see people even hiring people on site in Las Vegas, you know, from a temp agency and unless they're just modeling a garment for you, that's probably not the best idea. We have some suggestions on that pool because we see all sorts of teams being brought together to, to man the booth. I, a lot of people bring their mums mm -hmm. <laughs> because they spent a lot of time the sure. is present and watching them, you know, mm -hmm. build their brand and get it ready. Um, interns are also amazing. They mm -hmm. don't often mind sharing rooms because I know one of the, you know, cost um, inhibitants is hotels and travel and all of that. So driving from LA with your intern that's been briefed and has been with you probably for months and months <laughs> is better than nobody. Definitely. So um, those are just two yeah, suggestions. Well, we've also, we come across, um, I'm sure, more in probably sourcing international sellers that I'm not sure if anyone here is from another country, but if you are, make sure that they speak English. Um, I know it sounds right. Sounds a bit snobby, but it's true. You've got to have somebody who can communicate. And the other thing I would just add to Laura's comments about the booth is, if you saw some of the um, examples, and you were saying about not having black, remember that if you're showing something, white is the best background to show something. Don't have busy prints all over the place. Don't have red or any other color as a background. It will just drain away from what you're trying to sell. So it's important to keep the background clean and white and visual. Okay, and then uh, before we get into the frequently asked questions, the last step, which of course is the most important, is the follow up and follow through post show. I cannot tell you how many times. Now remember, I'll say it one more time. There's 4,000 exhibitors at Magic. You may see an exhibitor, and I know, and I've heard the story many times where. Urban Outfitters walked in my booth, Nordstrom walked in my booth, Scoop walked in my booth, and they're going to buy, they're, they're going to place an order. Well, those people then left your booth and walked in 200 other booths. So then you're waiting for the phone call. It's not going to happen. They're not, most likely, not going to call you first. So it's really, really important, as I think Laura mentioned, making sure you're keeping track of every single person you've talked to getting their contact information, and following up with them. Even a fun little 
post-show postcard or this is what you thought was exciting, you know, at the show. Let me, you know, what? how can I help it make you easy to place but that those people are busy they're in their hotel room they're still working their full-time job in their hotel room late at night doing their buys so make make their job easier by being in touch with them after the show okay so next we're just going to go through from the various new exhibitors that we all experience every season some of the typical questions that are asked so one that probably comes up most often I'm going to ask Sharon, one of our retail specialists. How do I make an appointment with the retailers I want to see at the show? Okay. Uh, hello, this is Sharon. Thank you. Um, the most important thing for the retailers is they have a pie. They have a certain amount that they're going to buy from the brands that they have continued to see for many, many years. So you're a new guy, so you've got to get that buyer to come and see you somehow. Sometimes at a trade show, they really don't want to make an appointment. So for you to get them to make an appointment, you need to do something pre-show, which we've all discussed here in the last half hour. Uh, a postcard is great. An email, of course, is wonderful because, like I mentioned, most buyers are on email quickly. But the postcard is important. And, and if you get a little bit of um, interest and you want to send a line sheet directly to the store before the show, that's very important. To get the actual appointment, you need to just be flexible with their schedule. And even if you're sure, you, oh, I don't want to work after 6 o'clock at night because I've got to do You're there for three days. This is your time to shine. This is it. So if they want to come at 7 o'clock, you need to be there at 7 o'clock for them. And you need to make sure that you, you agree. again, no food in the booth, make everything nice, have some water, even have something to serve them because it's important. If you have a specific appointment with the buyer, to make sure you also you get their phone numbers, you can follow up, get their cell phone, you want to give them your phone, you want to keep a communication at a trade show, because if you're sitting there waiting at 6 o'clock and they're not there, you may, it may have gotten tied up doing something. But to me, the best thing to do is to be persistent and to call ahead of time and also see, so if the assistant buyer will come, maybe they like I had calls one time, I was walking through the whole show, and she was just the assistant buyer, but guess what? She could be the next buyer. Exactly. So when you're talking on the phone, if they go, oh, I only want to talk to the buyer, don't always be flexible because retail right now is competitive and you're a new person. So to me, that's I think a, way, a so. good point you made, too, is that a lot of times the buyer does have the best intention and has made an appointment with you. So don't be offended if they don't show up because they've got waylaid, you know, that we have two convention centers. We have people have to travel back and forth to for appointments. So make sure that you keep track of the people you didn't see that said they would come see you and follow up with them after the show as well. And following up means, hi, this is Nancy from so-and-so. I know we had an appointment. You were probably swamped. Here's a, here are some highlights from my show that did really well, that I sold. These are my top sellers. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you want me to come visit you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right, Francis, we keep talking about a line sheet. I don't know what it is. What's a line sheet? So your line sheet is going to have uh, all your styles with style numbers, so you've got to make sure that you've got your style numbers and they make sense. And you can. everybody's got different methods of doing style numbers. So if I'm starting out and I'm doing spring, so it could be S, it could be next year, 2013, so it should be S13, type of fabric, it might be um, a polyester mix, so you can have PM, but you know immediately when you've got that style number what it is that you're addressing. Style number prices, so you've got all your prices down there, your delivery dates, and uh, a brief description. And we've got templates that we recommend if you want. I mean, it's just easy. You're putting it, uh, and I would say don't use a sketch. Mm -hmm. You're much better off to use a photograph. Well taken photograph as opposed to some crummy thumbnail sketch, that unless you're, an, you know, an art student from Otis. But I would say taking a good visual picture, putting them in the line sheet, making it look professional so that you know and you can refer to it. You don't give the line sheet out to everybody. You're only going to give it out to buyers who you really feel are serious because otherwise everybody's always worried and neurotic about somebody knocking you off. So you give it to buyers that you really feel are buyers who you want to deal with and you would give those out too. 
marketing material. Okay. And know that our retail team has to qualify every buyer, new buyer that wants to come on the floor. So we've qualified, pre-qualified as many people as we can, say us that you're in business, show us what you buy, give us invoices of who you buy from. So we are pre-qualifying not for finances, but that they are actual buyers for you. You are responsible to make sure that you make that you get the financing from these people, that they are qualified financially to buy you a product, and that you don't make that product until you know that you have that. We recommend that you do a credit check, and for any order that you get, it's going to be worth $15 to do a credit check. This is where, you know, you may not be able to use a factor, but you can at least use the factoring to do a credit check, and building those relationships will help you. Um, okay. Um, Linda, I have a T-shirt that I've created, and I'm thinking about um, designing some shoes. But I see that you keep talking about presenting a collection to the market. What, what does that mean? What's a collection look like? A collection is a range of product offer that you are bringing to market. For example, if you are a ready-to-wear collection, you have different pieces, um, components to that, dresses, skirts, tops, blouses, what have you. If you're a t-shirt collection, then you would bring your range of t-shirts, which are your collection for the season. And do you have any suggestions of how I should present this collection, Laura? Uh, you mean merchandising the booth? Yes. Um, yeah, kind of like we said earlier, on if you're just bringing t-shirts, mannequins for sure, maybe styling it with, with your suggested jeans and accessories and things like that. Um, I think a good question, too, with this is how much of each piece should I bring? Yes. And often we're asked, and I see some of the questions up on the board, is how I'm, I have a cash and carry booth or I have a standard booth at pool or project, how much should I bring? So, Francis, can you help answer that question? Well, I really don't know. I, I was going to ask, are, you, are they allowed to do cash and carry? Because I know that There is a sheet where I can answer. Well, maybe not. Cash and carry may is, is a separate issues. If I have a standard booth at Magic, how much product should I be bringing? And we talked earlier about look at the size of your booth before you decide to cram in like 3,000 t-shirts. So I'm assuming you bring a few samples of each size and each color. I don't know whether you need samples of sizing. I think you need samples. Maybe. Linda, I've had to answer. Yeah, I, I, I can try to answer this. So basically when you show up at the show, you want to mirror what you want to reflect the essence of your brand. I would tell you bring samples of all the colorways. It's imperative so you can show it if you can. Sometimes you can't, and then you, can, you can't get sample yardage, so you would have swatches, let's say, in a nice size so they can envision. But also, you want to de definitely make sure, okay, like Laura's saying, okay, you have one standard space, a little under 100 square feet, let's just say, at WWD Magic or a project. Okay, you get three walls. You're in line. Find out, are you a corner? Are you in line? Is there walls up? Are they down on one side? Okay, how is this going to look if I have two, you know, bars on each wall for each each for each rack, how many, do the math, figure it out. Usually SKUs, which are a number of samples that you have. If you have 100 SKUs, you can break it up and divide it accordingly so when they're walking by, it's symmetrically presentational, it's inviting, it, it just, you wanna go in there and just touch and feel. And I would definitely say it's, it's just 101, but candy or food in some capacity is very, and flowers, obviously, but candy, a bowl of candy is very inviting. You can get buyers. I know it sounds silly, but they'll come in. They're starving. They're not stopping. Mm -hmm. They're swimming from booth to booth, going in, water, candy, whatever you have. That only, that helps, too. It's another great way to get your brand message out there. A lot of people just a little giveaway of whether it's little candy bars or um, the continuous line did those brownie pops oh, with yeah. their message messaging on it, and their booth was packed just because they were doing the giveaway, and people are walking away with something that has your brand on it. And it's part of presenting your collection. That is part of it. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. I mean, and I also think it's a missed opportunity if you're just doing T-shirts. Yeah. It's like, why are you not including something else in there? 
that you could expand your brand identification and your possibility of making more money. It's not just T-shirts. That maybe you could use if you're using T-shirt unless you're doing blanks. But if you're using blanks and you're putting graphics on it, then why not do blanks with something else on it? Because you're just limiting yourself with just having T-shirts. If you can include other parts, it will also make it look better too. Merchandising it definitely. So, how do I get a showroom, Francis? Well, you know, it's one of my get, get probably one a day of people asking how do I find a sales rep, and I always my quip is, you know, how do you find a husband? <laughs> it's, it's not something that just happens. You just have got to find the right. They're going to work for you. They've got to believe in what you're selling. We were talking about selling today mm-hmm. at lunchtime. So they've got to believe in what it is, and you need to do your research. If you're looking for a rep, walk the tra- walk the shows, the marks, and find, if you do a trade show and you're walking around and you see a sales rep that's showing lines that you would like to also be shown with. So don't bother them then. Get their names and then take record. Where are they? Do a check on them because, you know, they're going to be charging you for selling and usually a uh, showroom participation fee. Mm-hmm. And, like, we've had designers who had a showroom in New York but not one in L.A., and they were paying $800 a month and not getting any sales. And I said, you better get on a plane tomorrow and find out. Right. And they, fly, you know, fly in, and suddenly they find that this sales rep's got 15 other lines, and their lines are hanging up in a closet. So good connections, network working, finding people you trust, who can sell for you. I'm sure you've all got, you know, your own ideas. Absolutely. And add one thing to that, also sales reps are looking for the line. They're out there also looking to find someone they're also making money in this, of course. So be prepared. If they come to you, you also, like France said, you have to make sure they're the right fit for you. So Definitely. you may be so flattered, oh my God, this man or woman wants to, you know, take my line and run with it, but you want to make sure that's right. So sometimes you can actually ask your account executives at Magic of recommendations, you know, because we do know in the industry some of these showrooms and sales reps, we can help you the best we can. Mm-hmm. You know, that could help a little bit too. By there, the there's a whole matrix mm-hmm. of showrooms across the United States mm-hmm. and international. Mm-hmm. But you can, I mean, New York, Pacific Northwest, the Rockies, West Coast, territory. I mean, yeah. you just really, like you're saying, you have to really do your due diligence to find out. Ask around. Google. You can find out so much about the brands, but definitely trolling in the buildings, seeing what, what collections they do represent is the quickest way. I sit with that brand. and You know, it's aspirationally inclined to think, okay, that's where I want to sit. That Oftentimes, that's where it starts. Mm-hmm. Also, if you've already identified your market niche, you know where you want to sell, go to those stores, find out who they buy from, which trade shows they go to, which reps they work with. You can work backwards. Work from where you have already know where you want to sell and find out who they work with. Um, We're talking about not, it's on here, but not selling to department stores in the beginning because they can kill you with one order. Um, That's a good question Nicola has here. Um, what about putting up a sign in your booth that we're looking for a rep? You can definitely do that. We, You can also... Uh, leave your business card at the show office uh, for your sales representative because we do sometimes have networking opportunities to match up uh, showroom or brands with reps. But really, talking to your industry peers is the best way to do this, and I, I think Suze could probably elaborate, having been a rep or represented many brands, that you have to be really choosy about who you go after. First, I think, honestly, thank you, Carolyn. First, I think, honestly, you have to decide whether you really want a sales rep or not. Mm -hmm. A lot of our brands on the floor are represented by themselves. They are not represented in the beginning by sales reps. It's a double-edged sword. As a designer, you are emotionally attached to your garments. Mm -hmm. You will get emotionally hurt by a buyer who says, I don't like that. It's like being a singer and having someone say, oh, I don't want you for the part. It's a part of you. It's one of your children. The reps very often feel the same way, but you have to decide, am I going to represent this? Am I going to have my best friend who's a really good salesperson come with me in the beginning and represent this for me, or do I want a professional sales rep? Having a sales repping organization, I represented somewhere of between six and nine lines at a time. They were like my children. 
how are you going to pay them? Are you, are you going to be happy to pay them? Yes, you are. If you decide to go the rep, the rep way, be happy to pay them big commissions because it means you're making money. Don't pull the line back the minute you start making money and saying, okay, this rep got me on the way, now I'm going to make it all corporate. Your reputation in the market will precede you. How you perform in the marketplace with your representatives and with your stores will get around. It's a very small community. When you're ready for a rep, when you're ready to be represented, when you can take on that financial responsibility, you get to the show, you can only do so many orders because you only have that financial backing, like you said, Francis. Make sure you can afford a sales rep before you hire one. That's the biggest thing that I can tell you. One of the questions, thank you, Sue. You're welcome. I think it's, it's very valuable advice. Um, are there services at Magic in Las Vegas to hire a salesperson to help at your booth? In your exhibitor's manual, there's um, information on hiring temporary services at the show, but I think your best bet would be contacting FBI in advance to get someone a little more seasoned, if at all possible, like we discussed. Uh, one more thing, though. What you were saying is so true, and that's why the designers fall in love with their own lines. Mm -hmm. And I would say you've got to have a Teflon coat because someone's going to come and say, whoa, Ooh, that's, that's horrible stuff, <laughs> and they start laughing at it, and you been months and months creating it. So that's why a sales rep can make, really help your company grow. So finding that right rep can make or break you. And I know that somebody was asking a question about department stores. Mm -hmm. Department stores will kill you if you don't have your financials in place because they'll want discounts and if they've got these massive orders. We had one of our manufacturers who been in business 10, 12 years, and they got a huge order, 250000 from Macy's. They didn't read all the manual. So that means you've got to sell, send your ship, your tops and your bottoms, and your, or you've got to be hangers this way and the labels that way. And so out of a markdown 200, money. Yeah, dot, markdown money and, you know, vouchers at the weekend. So out of a $250,000 order, they would charge back $170,000. They, I mean, he lost his company. I think and then they ramp up. That speaks to the, one of the questions right. about what do I do if Macy's walks into my booth? We all said run. Everybody, <laughs> everybody sort of, some people are answer, answering it here on the chat. but. Well, actually, the first thing you should do is if you're a woman owned business, a lot of them are, or minority owned businesses, get yourself registered with the SBA and as a minority owned business. And then these big department stores have. Vendor diversification days twice a year. Nordstrom's up in Seattle. Macy's mm -hmm. used to in San Francisco, and they will. The buyers will actually look at new products from vendor diversified minority-owned businesses, and they will actually nurture you through the first couple of orders. I'm sure you've had that. Theme. Absolutely, we do do a vendor diversified list, also by minority, by um, women-owned. Um, Macy's does its own seminar on it still. It's a great, in, that's good information. Any of you new orders who are thinking of selling or you're ready to sell to department stores, so you actually have a list of vendors who are minority owned. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's great. And also, you're you backing on what you said, Francis. It's not only that first order that Macy's or Nordstrom's places with you, but if you ramp up your production, it happens to companies that are in business for 30, 35 years, you get a big order, you ramp up your production. For some reason, it isn't one of the best sellers on the floor, and they don't come back and order from you next season. You've hired all these people, and you're a young company. What are you going to do with them? Mm -hmm. How are you going to pay all these people? Sure. Actually, uh, I did want to mention something. Going back to our new exhibitors that are maybe smaller companies, mm -hmm. the buyers love to meet the person who actually started the company. Absolutely. They love to meet the designer. Oh, yeah. The, the, Maybe there is a, a brother team, you know, that they both came from Brooklyn and made these shoes that their grandfather, oh, boy, they love that. They love to meet the guy from Italy, the woman from China who makes the boots. This is very important when we first start out because that's what we're here to help you with is to make you get to that next course point, that level. But many buyers that I talk to, they're so excited they actually have met for the design the shoes. For the clothes. That, that's very important for you. So we want you to come and be a big family. 
Wear your own clothes. <laughs> you know, exactly. And very quickly, so you know, as well as we're we're sitting here getting you set up to sell yours, we're also meeting with the retailers, giving them information on how to work with you on our Retail 101 seminar, mm -hmm. the first morning of the show. We're training the buyers. Talk to your manufacturers. Find out what their terms are. Find out who they're selling. Find out how their shipping is. So they're going to ask you all the questions that we're giving you now. So we're training both ends at MAGIC. I wanted to add one thing about a showroom that I think is so important. If you can find a showroom, first of all, who you're going to work with and trust implicitly and have a connection with, look for that. But secondly, if you can get a showroom who's very astute with merchandising and is agile and nimble, that can work with an anthropology to get you know, certain orders for certain fill-ins because we're in a day and age now of replenishment mm -hmm. and these stores are looking for really great brands that can deliver. Right. If you have an alignment with a showroom that that is really in alignment with these stores, your chances of succeeding are far better. And find a showroom who's a really good at merchandising, mm -hmm. taking your line and calling it and calling you up. Oh, so and so, you know, this silhouette is unbelievable. Can you do this and this? And it, it will be the difference between you getting an order or not. Actually, Anthropology is a good example because they, they, they are a good one to work with new companies. Mm -hmm. they, they do to place small orders, and um, they're pretty good with new companies. I'm just, I'm just drumming my own drum here. So uh, Bethann was asking about the books. In my book, Fashion for Profit, all your answers are in there. So she's oh. advertising somebody else's up there. So <laughs> I'm just blowing my own horn. Good for you. Blow away. <laughs> blow away, my dear. <laughs> Great point, Linda. Um, so moving on, a few more FAQs and a few more questions up on the um, site right here. A lot of people don't know what a factor is. Francis, can you explain that for us? Well, a factor actually is somebody who will um, place, if you, once you've got an order and the day you ship, they will advance to you 8% of the money owed you. So, if, and, if you, and then you've got to wait 30, 60 days. They advance you the, the money the day you ship. You've got PO factoring where if you've got an order, you can go and get a PO factor, but it's usually not recommended because you're paying interest on that loan. As soon as you advance this money, then you're paying interest. On it. So, but factors don't normally upfront money until you've got like half a million dollars in orders. So, you know, you can get refactored companies that we actually got a list of on our website, but you need to have a relationship with them and they don't normally like to factor it on a first order. Remember, they're investing in you, it's their money. And I've actually had people who said, I said, can you, have you got collateral? Have you got a home that you can take a loan out? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't want to risk my money. <laughs> Why would somebody else risk their money if you're not prepared to risk your money? Exactly. So if you own a home and you can take a line of credit out, that's probably the best way to begin. But factoring can really help with your monies uh, coming in as far as your cash flow is concerned once you've got the orders to build on. So I'm not sure. Yeah. There was another question related to financing it's, uh, from Lori, I think it was. If you have a rep and they get a big order for you and the buyer backs out, is the rep responsible? No. Never. 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 You're always responsible. There are importers and distributors, which are different from sales reps that sometimes buy your product first and then sell them to many other um, smaller retailers, but um, that's a whole different ballgame. But Distribute. also make sure from the, uh, from the get-go, when you hire a rep, that they know that if there are returns, there's a certain percentage of returns and chargebacks that you are charging the rep back for. Because you don't want your rep to give you an order that's just not going to fly. I mean, you're going to pr produce that order. They are responsible in their commissions. If that order is returned, they don't get paid. Mm -hmm. Or they get paid a certain percentage. When would you recommend that they get paid? I mean, that's sometimes a question, and we always say they get commission on what you ship. That's right. right. But how would how, the fifteenth of every month? Fifteenth of every month. Fifteenth, and you write that check, and then the next check you take back. You know, charge back the charge chargebacks or the cancellations. But it's the way you want to be paid, that's how you pay your rep, because they're depending on you to ship. The same way, if you don't ship. 
So this is a really good question and comes up often also from Cajendo. Uh, could you please talk about terms and payment arrangements? Can you ask for a deposit from a buyer when they place an order? Um, you can ask for it, not whether or not you're going to get it. Um, if, if you're going to do something specific for a store, definitely you have to get that. So if they're saying uh, we want their, our logo on it or our label on it, so they're commissioning you to do it, then definitely. Then we also recommend now is taking credit cards. Uh, so you, someone places an order, take their credit card information. You don't take it as being carte blanche, absolutely fine. You then do a credit check on them. So make sure that that credit check, that credit card is not going to bounce and it's not somebody else's. You know that they are who they say they are, that they don't have a fictitious address and they're going to pay you. We also recommend that you ship They'll usually tell you the way they want it shipped, but I would suggest also shipping through UPS where they have a collection where the store will pay UPS, UPS then pays you. The store will very unlikely to bounce a check on UPS. So that way then UPS pays you. So that if they bounce a check, it's going to be bounced on UPS. Mm -hmm. We do recommend and we do tell the stores not to give cash at the show. Um, we had a buyer show up with $30,000 in cash. We walked him off the show back to the hotel, put it in his safe. We do recommend to our buyers that they bring open credit cards and, uh, and we'll put down 50% sometimes of the order, which you charge when you go to manufacture it. Then the other 50% when you ship it, so that you're paid ahead of time. But you have to call and get their permission or the credit companies will allow them to dispute, it. dispute the it. credit card. Um, a lot of the buyers, and I tell my buyers all the time, bring your mileage credit cards. Mm -hmm. They get mileage for the orders that they place. Okay. Um, and they still get 30 days. Right. Financing is obviously a big subject. We could be here all day. Um, <laughs> another another uh, question which comes up often is do I need to set a minimum and what is a minimum? Now, I'm going to ask Sharon to answer that question, but keeping in mind that Magic mirrors the buying audience of the U.S. marketplace, and 65% of our buyers that walk the show are um, specialty stores. So this is why we talk often about what minimums are and what these types of stores are expecting. Actually, I feel that most of the buyers that come to your booth, if they're a professional buyer, mm -hmm. they're expecting a minimum to be set. And a minimum would be, even let's say you're a small company, you have a six-piece minimum. Mm -hmm. right? You can start with that. Small store, Oklahoma City comes in, oh, I love that shoe, I'd love to buy it, but I can't buy 12 of the same you know, color and the same style. Can I you know, split it? So you kind of work with them a bit, but you absolutely should have a minimum. Not just you can buy one of this, one of that. You'll be making things, and you won't make any money on it because you don't make any money making one. Well, why well, 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 shouldn't they sell just one piece at a time? Because if a store is a real store, a real retailer, mm -hmm. they're not buying one. Now, if it's an expensive handbag for eight hundred dollars wholesale, maybe you might, you know, mm -hmm. they'll get like about right. one handbag. You know. But you really, to make money as a manufacturer, as a person, a designer, you don't really want to just let any any store come just by one of this, one of that. Like maybe the, the cash and carry thing is different in pool. Well, also, I'm talking about world. Place separate and cash and carry. In yeah. the ready to wear world, it's a little bit different also because if you're a high end designer, very often the high end designers will have one showpiece that they say you can buy one of these and that will be your window piece. But then and they then might have like a dollar minimum. minimum. Right. Then there's a dollar yeah, minimum. down that order. That's true. But these one, down. these okay. two, of these are only when you're at the really high end couture and you wear. In the regular world of clothing, it's no no less than four to six pieces say, per. Or what they call providers. One, 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 one. One, yeah. one, 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 one across. Yeah. yeah. Oh, one, 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 oh, one, one, two, one, one, two, one. One, 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 one. And it depends whether you have plus sizes, regular sizes. You have to know your business. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Bethany asks, if you're a new emerging brand, is there a cap recommendation for orders, i.e., when is your order too big, when is it too small? 
you have to know that before you go. We talked about you know having how much money you have available, what's your production capacity. If you go there and you suddenly get a big order, can you produce it? Do you have the money to produce it? Can the sewers that you've got produce it? Where are you making it domestic, internationally? Those questions you need to know before you go, Beth Ann. Which okay. seasons do you want to answer that? Jasmine, right? Jasmine. Which season should we be showing at the August event? I think as Linda? Ready. As ready all the way out till early spring. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so I think we need to sort of wrap up a little bit and maybe have a few more questions at the end. Should we so, have we, we can. We'll talk about international buyers at the end. Um, one of the questions was, how do I get the checklist for pool, the one that's called This Way to the Pool? And it gets emailed to you after you've contracted with us. Um, and then it's also available in the Exhibitor Lounge, which you should all have login details for. Um, and if none of that makes sense, just shoot us an email and we'll help you. And actually, anyone that's contracted for any of the magic events, if you want this document, it's, it's helpful across the board for all of the shows. So we talked a lot about merchandising. So the next couple of slides are just showing you examples. I know Laura and Linda and a few others mentioned not eating in your booth. You see a lot of people when you walk trade shows sitting at their booth on their computers. Uh, talking to each other. Um, see this gentleman smiling, st standing out in front of his booth. Invite people in. I've walked the magic show floor and actually many times asked people to stop napping in their booth <laughs> or, um, you know, sort of pleasantly reminding them that while they're working on their computer, they're missing the opportunity to sell. And we talked about the investment that you're making and the time is a very short period of time. So I always tell my staff um, that on the magic team that you plan on not sleeping for one week while you're in Las Vegas because you're spending the entire day at the trade show talking to your customers. We only have three to four days to really impress them and put on the best event that Las Vegas or even the U.S. offers or the world for fashion for that matter. And at night, you're taking those clients out, schmoozing them, having one-on-one -on -one time. So rest up and be happy, even if you have a horrible hangover. Make sure that nobody knows that um, and really get, get – um, this is your opportunity. Another way that you can really increase your brand awareness, we've talked about doing things from having having – things as small as a candy bowl in, in your booth to a sponsored cocktail event, additional signage, ads in the show directory, even in other publications or online um, fashion publications where you can let people know you're going to be at Magic and here's your booth number and please come by for a free cocktail or whatever it is that you will, you'd be interested. Even like the show lanyards. Um, displays throughout the show. There's many, many opportunities, so you can talk to your sales rep about that. Um, somebody asked a question about cash and carry. Uh, it's not a traditional package across the marketplace, but it isn't cool. It's, it's basically a very cool-looking two, three-foot by six-foot display. Um, so you kind of have to work and be creative in how you present your um, products. We've got some pictures that we can send you that give you good examples on how to maximize that space. But again, you want it to be clean, look like a boutique, and not go crazy with bringing tons of stuff. There's also storage underneath, so you can keep bringing stuff out as you sell it. One of the questions um, I don't believe we answered from Mike was how to make your booth look like a store display. And do most exhibit exhibitors bring props? I would say hands down yes that you should bring props. There are some show areas that are juried as far as what you can put in your booth and you have to have it pre-approved. But really make it, again, inviting. I often tell people to go to Target or Ikea or wherever, uh, even in Las Vegas, because unfortunately, if you get to Las Vegas and you have to order accessories through 
some of the vendors we work with, you're going to spend three to four times as much money as you would be going to Pier 1 or Cost Plus or any of those types of places where you can get um, nice, inexpensive props to make your booth look, again, like a, a display in a store. Is there a problem with unions? Not if they're no. carrying in their own props. If they have to have it shipped or somebody else has to carry it in for them, then it's going to be much more expensive. But can't they pay a one-time, as an exhibitor, they can pay a one-time drayage fee the, that, that it, allows them to bring things in and out? Depending on the booth package, yes. And they can go over that with their individual sales rep for their show. Okay, and then next, I think we're going to have turn it back over to Francis for show planning. Okay, I'm just going to go through these briefly. Just make sure that once you've come back from Magic and you've got your orders in, you remember you've got a certain amount of time to build up on those orders. You've got you're going to analyze. Okay, maybe some of these orders I'm not going to take because you're um, not you're not going to be cutting enough to make it worthwhile. If you have to change any orders, make sure you let the retailers know. Otherwise, they're going to be very upset. Remember, they've merchandised their store around the products that they have bought and planned for at Magic. So if you suddenly decide that you're not going to make that orange top, then you need to let them know and say, okay, we can, we're not producing the orange top, but we, are, we do have a bright pink one that will substitute very nicely and it's a very good seller. So remember, you don't want to leave, leave that hole in their merchandise plant. Otherwise, they're not going to be buying from you again. So you come home, then you're going to be thinking, okay, I'm going to be doing my production patterns and analyzing them. You're going to be getting a marking and grading done. Hopefully, you've got this all sorted out beforehand. Um, you're going to be building that cutting ticket, estimating your yardage and ordering the fabric. Remember one little detail that when you get your fabric, inspect it immediately. Don't leave it in the corner wrapped up in brown paper because it could be when you unroll it, it's the wrong color, the wrong width, or it's got flaws in it. So make sure that you inspect the goods as soon as you get it. Um, quality. Quality is a production pattern. You can have a sample that you can show at Magic, but you need to make a production sample. And the production sample is what's known as, a, or it can be called a so-by. So your production sample has got everything worked out. In bigger companies, the production sample maker, the production pattern maker are paid very good money to analyze the styles and to um, think about, you know, maybe they can make it more efficiently if they had a seam in the back or those things need to be worked out with somebody who understands your production. So you can have a production samples made by the contractor. Remember that you do not want to ship and then have goods returned. Not only will you not make any money, but you've lost those relationships. They will not buy from you again. So you better make sure you've got your production all ironed out. Infantry buildup, make sure now we're talking about selling immediates. Somebody asked when, it, when is immediates, immediates or immediates. If they want, they'll tell you if they want them in two weeks or a month mm -hmm. and let you know. Have you got any, anything to add on that as far as? Sometimes they even ship them from the show. You'll call back if you have goods in the warehouse and they need goods immediately. They'll say, go ahead and ship them. Yeah. That happens a lot. It does happen a lot. We're down on this. They're at the show and they were buying so much closer to the cup. Yeah, I was going to say, why don't you mention, because yeah. with the, it used to be such... It used to be that you were buying six months to eight months out. Now, because of the economy being the way it is, they're going to come to show and they say, you know what, I've got a hole on my floor. Can you fill it for me? Mm -hmm. And as a new company, that gives you the opportunity to say, hey, I'm new, but I've got this, mm -hmm. and let me ship it to you. But if you can't do it, please don't tell them you can not right. because you'll never get the opportunity again. Right. This is a question from Alex you might want to address. Um, if our production is based internationally in Asia, is there more leeway on delivery dates? Okay. I think you have to be really careful with delivery dates, you guys, especially if you're new because you have to find out the terminology as ready. What does that mean? When's the start ship? When's it? You know, complete end ship. ship, complete ship. Is it in house? You got to be really careful. Is it as ready? Yeah. Can you start the shipping? As ready doesn't mean you can ship size two and size four now, and then size sixteen and eighteen later. Yeah. It means you ship a complete style, but they don't want the top without the bottom. They can't sell the top without the bottom. So, if it's an as ready, it means they want part of a 
collection to sell on their floor. They don't want just piecemeal. Wouldn't probably be an immediate if it was being produced in Asia. No. Unless they had warehousing here. Correct. So um, warehousing here and you've got stuff in your warehouse, <laughs> sell it. Okay, so remember that 80% of your business will be in 20% of your style. That's usually what happens. So you're going to have some really good sellers and maybe those bodies are going to carry over to next season. Post-planning uh, delivery dates, late deliveries could result in canceled orders or chargebacks. So the person who is doing internationally, make sure that they can ship on time. You know that the timelines and they, that, that you know who you're doing business with. Also, there is, who was it? One of our members last week was talking about, there's a lot of international shipments coming in and then being shipped wrong, you know, the details wrong. So that actually, Min was saying, that he's got a big business going through and redoing a lot of this production that's not being made correctly. So if you are doing internationally, Alex, know who you're working with. Okay, it's an important to know your delivery dates. If you're going to be shipping in uh, March, April, May, know when those are, when they're expected. Best to ship at the beginning of the window rather than at the end. Things go wrong, and if you leave it to the end, you're going to be late. So keeping your customers happy, your final customer, remember they need to buy the goods, so you've got to buy who's buying the goods, then you need a customer to buy your goods. Garment should retain balance, price, quality, and creativity and fit. If one or more of these factors are below standard, then there will be no first or return sale. So remember that relation is all about that relationships and the trust that you build with your buy it. So they come back and say, hey, Laura, hey, Linda, I love what you did last time. I want to reorder from you. I think, thank you, Francis. Sandra asked a question about the exhibitor manual that you can find on magiconline.com. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of things before we close. Uh, if you're attending Magic this season, the dates are staggered. So a very important reminder to everybody that's not only attending but exhibiting that at the Las Vegas Convention Center, we have WWD Magic, FN Platform, Footsteps, Sourcing at Magic, and Home at Sourcing at Magic. Those shows are running August 21st to the 23rd. No, this is the 20th. Only Sourcing opens on the 20th at noon. The other shows at the LVCC all open on August 21st at 9 a.m. Sourcing opens on August 20th at noon so that our brands can shop sourcing before they start exhibiting. And then the Mandalay Bay Convention Center opens on August 20th at noon, or at, I'm sorry, at 9 a.m. And that's menswear, street, pool, slate, project, and workroom. So, um, I'd like to thank uh, both Francis and Trish from the FBI for putting this webinar together for us today. And as Francis, Francis mentioned, she does have the book uh, Fashion for Profit. You can find information on that on the FBI website. We mentioned the Salesman Guide. You can find that at the California Mart or also online. At the International Bookstore. Yes. The International Bookstore in the California Mart. Correct. And then you can buy it online as well. Yeah. So we'll right. Various versions. You can also go on to NRS website, the National Retail Federation, if you're trying to figure out what retailers you want to target. It's a very useful website for that. And the other place you can get loads of information is our Magic Seminar Series. We have over 40 conferences each show, and many of those are related to many of the things we talked about today and legal issues, people talking about how to get certified and keep up to date on the latest rules and regulations when it comes to manufacturing. It's all at the show, so make sure you use the pre-show planner, which you will find on our website um, launching in about two weeks, that can um, help you interact with other brands and um, retailers. So, Laura, Linda, Sharon, 
um, and Sue, thank you so much. It was great to have a panel of experts. And um, with that said, I think we'll wrap it up. Go ahead. Is there a video that they can watch about yes. magic anywhere? There is on our website. You can see that we were going to show you a video today, but we had technical difficulties. So please go on the website if you'd like to preview what your experience might be on the show floor. I just wanted to add that um, today, if you've got 24 hours to join the FBI for a show special with Magic for $200, and part of that you get an hour's consultation, so we have consultants to go through all your planning before you go. Better to do it before you go rather than after. So Trish will be so, in touch with you. Uh, actually, if you're interested and you want to save the $50, um, I'm going to give you till Wednesday since most of the working day is gone today. But um, give me a call at the office either tomorrow or Wednesday, and we can sign you up for your annual membership with, at a 50 cent discount. 50, 50 cent. $50 discount. <laughs> um, and I will be sending everyone who has registered for this webinar a link to download the recorded version. So if anyone missed any part of it, you'll be able to refer to it later. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.